Hey everyone, my name is Nathan Pay, and welcome to another episode of Coffee and Crypto. We've got a special guest, Nerd Love Infinity, with us today, and we've got a real special one uh, planned for you guys. There's quite a few things we want to try to get through today, so we'll see if we Almost can kind of jam it all in. But the first thing that we're going to cover is an update on Ragnarok Labyrinth NFT. There's quite a bit of things that they've addressed with their game, plans for the future. We've been playing it quite a bit since we last talked about it here on the channel. And I also think this is just a really important topic to talk about onboarding and mass adoption, yeah. which is actually going to lead us into our next topic, which is a, another title, Nino Kuni Cross Worlds. You heard that right. And, Nino Kuni. Right? <laughs> there's 4 million downloads so far, and they've already collected over a million dollars worth of revenue in like the first week yeah, of the right. game launch. So there is mass adoption happening on a love unprecedented level and kind of the funny thing is a lot of people don't even know they're playing an nft game for sure. <laughs> Guaranteed. <laughs> so i want to talk a little bit about that what that means how they're kind of bringing that into the ecosystem what that really means for play to earn and then almost kind of naturally that'll extend us into our final topic which is talking about the partnership of go gala games epic games and their new play to earn title called grit and really what so that's going to do, yeah. you know, because Epic has tens, if not hundreds of millions of users. So it's, we've got mass adoption stuff going on all over the place. Yeah. So just to kind of jump right into it, let's talk a little bit about Ragnarok Labyrinth NFT, mm -hmm. kind of get you up to date from my side. I've been playing since consistently since we've last talked. Yep. The nice part about it is I'm at a part in the game now where I'm higher near the end. So I don't have to commit quite so much time every day. You know, I'm doing my dailies, maybe 30 minutes of actual active gameplay. Then I kind of just let it run for the most part. And the Labyrinth token or Labyrinth point that I've been able to collect, which is really just on buff. I don't know why they have the two different names. I hope they kind of fix that. Yeah. Has agreed. really been able to make me see that I've, I've made enough to pay for the passes and the microtransactions that I've already spent. That's really exciting to me to see. I mean, right off the bat, I like that's that's like the minimum you like you could expect as a win because mm -hmm. like you basically that's like playing that's like paying for PlayStation Plus, and then at the end of the year having earned a bunch of things during that subscription that added up to the amount of a PlayStation Plus membership, right? If even if you just did that, would you hate that? Absolutely not, because you basically have the premium subscription for free. Yes, right. So you're getting the premium experience of the game and all of those benefits without actually paying for it. So that's kind of cool. Does that mean like, you know, is, is that as exciting as the kind of things we hear about, you know, people making thousands of dollars a day? No. But is that pretty cool compared to like normal gaming? I mean, yeah, Absolutely. that's like having a free premium ride. Yeah. I think. And on my end, I've been playing it without buying any of the uh, microtransaction passes yet. Mm -hmm. And I've still made it like probably a third of what you have. Yeah. And it's... A, you know, it's a reasonable amount for how little hours I've put per day and how much fun I'm having during those hours. Well, let's just think of the fact it's a free-to-play game that you actually earn something from. Yeah. that's That hasn't just, existed before. Not just sinking my time. Right. Exactly. Actually, I can't think of another title like that. I'm sure there's some play-to-earns where you've gotten, like, some benefit from doing the fleet of play missions. Maybe you completed a certain aspect of the game. You get awarded a small NFT. But the actual ongoing earnings... I really can't think of any titles off the top of my head that have that aspect where, yeah, you can just continue to do the free-to-play and you're actually continuing to collect the token and yep. getting a piece of that. And I think that's why Ragnarok Lab with NFT is almost historic in a sense. A lot of people are kind of writing it off because they think, oh, it's not really an NFT game. It's just another Ragnarok game with microtransactions. No. The, the issue in the community was the gas. And that was really the yeah. big kind of FUD that happened is they went, well, look, if I'm making this play to earn currency, I can't take it out. It's on the Ethereum mainnet and I'm getting charged a gas fee when I swap from my Labyrinth point to Newton. And then I'm getting charged another gas fee when I swap Newton to Ethereum. It's not worth Definitely. it. Definitely. I think that's what a lot of people who may have been experienced in the space, like the play to earn space, what it saw when they're like, oh, there's two like steps to mm -hmm. conversion here. Mm -hmm. Is this going to be worth my time? And I and they the, funny enough as we're like pretty much as we're all thinking that yeah. they came up with a solution that's right that they're going to start implementing and then you got a whole bunch bigger plans than we were even expect, expecting originally. I mean, last episode we were kind of just like speculating, hey, mm -hmm. well, this is the first of many they say are going to be there for NFT games. Now they have some real concrete announcements about that. 
Yeah, and to kind of let's maybe move into that. They they talked about they're looking into uh, bridges potentially, to, uh, layer two solutions. So there, not only does it show me that they they're aware that this is what people are concerned about is the mm-hmm. gas fees, they're actually working on a viable solution, and they're using terminology that shows me they're up to speed with the crypto space. And yeah, they understand this. That frequently freaks me out when I see like an announcement on a server in Discord or when I see like a white paper or something that doesn't even use terms in the proper context yes. in the crypto you can world. Tell they don't like, understand. It's it's almost like seeing a meme that has a spelling mistake. You're like, super impractical phrase, but spello. And then you're like, <laughs> Okay, whole thing's ruined for me. I don't know if you're like that for me, but like yeah, I, for me it just ruins it. So yeah. like same deal with crypto, and I like knowing they know their stuff. Well, here's another example. They immediately talked about bridges as a solution, and then went on the very next sentence was, we understand that security is a huge concern when it comes to this. So if we go that route, we're going to make sure we're, we're double downing on our security. And it was like, hey, wait, that's actually where most exploits and issues happen is when bridges are introduced, right? That's what happened with Ronin and Axie Infinity. It was their bridge. There's lots of other titles and other examples. Yeah, and definitely I like that. I even though it's like sometimes painful to talk about those things, mm-hmm. I like talking about painful things more than I like sweeping them under the rug because yes. they're painful and then just pretending they don't exist. Because, yeah, because then you're gonna end up falling into those same pitfalls. And I like that right out the gate, they're like, "We know this isn't the most secure idea, but it's one idea we have, and we're gonna make it the most secure as possible if we're gonna do that." And I, it just excites me that the Ragnarok is one. Of many NFT games that this Newton token is going to be yeah, able to go Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. The between. planets. Yeah. Right? Unbuff planet. is. This is just one game that that orbits said planet. And I'm, I'm really excited to see some of the future ones too. Me too. And the way I kind of understood it, it's almost like they're creating this metaverse. And each of the planets are going to be the individualized games. So yeah. we've got Ragnarok Labyrinth NFT as one planet. Now they we see SNK on there, and there's some in their NFT marketplace. There's some SNK SNK fighter characters, so I'm sure we're going to probably get an SNK game. I would even love that. even if not, let's just imagine SNK the new version or NFT one they make becomes another planet. Well, what they said was this Newton token that you can swap your on it or your labyrinth point for is going to be the governance token for their whole ecosystem. So now you can vote on maybe what the next game is they do or changes or updates to the game. And I really like that idea because I've too. seen, and you know, lending to what you mentioned earlier with Grit and Gala Games, I think part of why their success has been so explosive recently is because they have that idea of we got a bunch of different studios and a bunch of different games and a bunch of different genres, but they all equate to this token that if, you know, if you're bored with Townstar now and you want to try something else... Cool. Shift all of your assets and get your town yeah. get get your town coin cashed out. Get your gala and then figure out your initial investment for a new thing in our ecosystem and then buy some of that. You know, and then if that just ends up exploding for you and then there's a new update in Townstar or or a new update in mm-hmm. you know one of their other games that they've got along there's one of the many games that they've got along the line there in gala, then you just go shift back into that or put some of your earnings back into it. Well, companies it. have to prevent try to prevent people from exiting. Right, they have to almost yeah. make it. It has to be easy to exit, but also enticing enough that you want to reinvest back into their ecosystem and keep going and keep things. And I think that's why we're seeing these smart models of these metaverses with multiple games, because mm-hmm. that to me is there's going to be way more seam a seamless experience of what you said, moving from one game to the next. But now you become a loyal customer of that metaverse or of that of gala i just or anything it, i actually just had the perfect way to think about it yeah. for like your average person think about it like casinos in las vegas casinos okay. in las vegas <laughs> there you go especially the ones with the gigantic hotels attached to them there's many main ones on the drag i'm sure you guys anybody who's been to las vegas knows yeah you they want you to never leave that building, yeah. right? And some people are cool with that. Some people, they got all these little shops, they got a couple cool little restaurants, they got all their gambling, and they got their pool, and that's fine for them, yeah. right? And for those people, they're going to keep giving you all these cool attractions, like digital versions of the Beatles. You got your members cool card, th- too. Exactly, yeah. right? And some people, that's what they want. They want that experience where they don't have to go far, and they get everything all in one place. Mm-hmm. And so that will always be fostered that way for these kinds of big gala-like networks. Then there's other people that just want to come in, See some of the sites, get some of the exclusive meals, see the one cool performance they have there, have that exclusive meal at that place, done. I've done this place and I'm done. 
right? And that's why I think that model works. That, that's exactly what this is like here. You either want to stay in the casino and keep going around on all the things because you really like that particular ecosystem, or you want to keep going down the strip. That's and a great I, analogy. And I think that that's what this presents, this model presents, instead of just going, hey, you have to go here and I hope you have fun. Right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way to look at it. And then they also talked about, because I don't want to miss this, yeah. uh, NFTs and how they're going to be bringing that into the game, looking at not just gear, but leveling up char- or, you know, buffs for your character, uh, adding extra utility. They used a bunch of kind of vague terms to explain what it could do but basically left it open-ended saying that, yes, we're looking for lots of ways to bring in NFTs. We want to make this lucrative for players. We also want to prioritize people who are playing more. So there's more of an incentivization See, no, of doing I, that. I think that brings up a conversation that we have to have as well, because we have, do you think that everything being NFTs is the way to go? Or do you think some of it being NFTs, such as like EX skins and things like that, and then some of it being things that are accessible by everybody is the way to go? Because I really feel like if they were to go with every single item, every single material, every single character, everything is an mm-hmm. NFT, that might actually take a step back with what they've done so far. Whereas if they add their I own... Agree. I think the best way to do this is to now add new content that wasn't in the previous Ragnarok Labyrinth and add that as NFT collections that Me too. have their own value. Me too. I don't want them to take the non-NFT... I almost don't want to call them assets, but... You, that, I can't think of a better term. Maybe equipment or items. Virtual items is the yeah. best way I've heard, heard okay. it referred to. I don't want to see those shift into NFTs now. Because then you're going to feel like you always would have been better off before, maybe. Or there'll be kind of some weirdness about that. I think that they should add new features, new equipment, new things that are NFT only. Or maybe when you when you fight like a rare Labyrinth boss, you can get a particular type of equipment that's NFT. And that yeah. has a super low drop rate or something like that. Now... That's actually a really good point to segue over to Nino Kuni mm-hmm. and to kind of start it off with the the thing that really impressed me the most is what Netmarble Netmarble wants to be a tech company that provides NFT and crypto solutions to game development companies. So it's not just them so they're not staging themselves as like a new gaming studio or network per se. They're that's kind of... right. They want to be kind of like almost like Ragnarok. They've got the metaverse. They want multiple games under their metaverse. But this one's a little bit different because they're they're taking the tech approach where they're saying like, hey, we want to be able to help multiple studios with NFT and crypto stuff. That's really cool. And then when they first released the game... <clears throat> And it was kind of interesting. You had to download it on mobile, and then you could link your email account, and then you could play it on PC. And there was basically no NFT crypto stuff, but the tokens were in the game. Like, you could see that they were there. You could see that the menu was there. And I thought we had months before they were going to bring it all in. You thought but, they were just kind of like, here's just like, yep. get, com- get familiar playing, and, and then, and no. by the way, we're going to add some crypto. And I was wrong. It was like right away. Like, right away, they're like, okay, now you're earning the Terrorite token, uh, the asteroid token and is already this in like the game. for the people that have played only like you know if you're like me and you played like five to ten hours of the one Nino Kuni on the PS3 and then you forgot to go back and, and play I played it all. them all uh, <laughs> and then like you know is this one like similar in the sense that you're like using the char- little characters to battle or are you kind of like a person in this world that this you're is a great question with? this to me feels like a combination of all the MMOs and mobile MMOs that we've seen there's almost too many game types. You've wow. got like, oh geez, there's world bosses, raid bosses, uh, endless tower challenges. Literally think of like every kind of little game mode feature from a mobile MMO game. Now you've got Nino Kuni Cross Worlds. Like wow. just navigating the menus and understanding all the opportunities is a little overwhelming. So in the beginning, I actually got to a point I was like, this is too much. <laughs> like, I don't know if I can keep up with this every day. There's like... 10 tower dungeons I got to do. Not really 10. There's like three, Yeah, you know, and then there's world bosses and then there's these bounty hunts. And then, and then I've got like five modes for familiars. There's a familiar dueling. There's a familiar adventure mode. But after going through it a couple of times and getting familiar, I started to really fall in love with that aspect because there's so much diversity in the game Mm -hmm. and there's so much to do that I could play half an hour a day, do my dailies, kind of be on with it. There is an auto battler mode, but you have to collect the time in order to be oh, AFK. Oh, so you have like a limited amount of AFK time and then you got to go right. back and play a bit to yeah. earn it back up? Yeah. So and I like that because me too. then you can't just be like, okay, 
Create 17 accounts and sit at home and be a data lord. Correct. You know, yes. it's kind of nice. Yes. Now, I actually haven't even used it yet because there's been so much for me to accomplish. I'm level 42. I'm just getting into the world raid bosses and stuff. But there's too much for me to do to even take advantage of that auto battler yet. So I feel like things are still going to scale down as far as time commitment goes. Mm -hmm. But I feel like we have this is history in the making. We've got 4 million downloads. They've already collected $100 million worth of revenue. And if you take a look at their tokenomics model, 67% of this Terrorite token is supposed to go back into the game ecosystem. Yeah, that kind of blew me away. Me like too. If we're talking, if you're a person that like, okay, rev dis, what's the distribution here? Yep. That's the first thing I'm, I'm interested in. 67%, that's what they it's said. It's high. That's huge. Right? Usually you'll see 20 or 30 is the play to earn, and then 20, 30 to staking, and then 20, 30 to team. And, there's and like, I think the reason know. why for that, and it makes sense, obviously, is that most people don't have a game and a studio with already functioning things to start. Whereas Netmarble, they're a company we know. They, If you go on their wiki, they've made several games. You'll be at least able to pick out one that you're like, oh, yeah, yeah. that. Right? Mm -hmm. So they probably had the capital to create a really good game beforehand and then, you well, know, whereas I find point. that a lot of the time the reason the rev disc is lower on, like, how much they're giving to the rewards is because they need enough of it to actually make Operate. the game they're promising to give you. Yeah. Whereas these bigger companies, they can be like, here's the game. Do you want? And just kind of go from there. Yeah, and I'll add one more point to that. Yeah. Like, most crypto projects, they have to sell a percentage of the original token allocation to private seed round investors, yes, right? So that will naturally lower the amount that they can give back to play to earn, where Netmarble is like, no, we're not selling any tokens to anyone. Here's here's all the 100% distribution broken down, and it's not being sold to other people outside of the game. And it was like, wait, that's really cool to Agreed. see, because that actually gives established game companies a potential advantage coming into this space because they can offer higher rewards to their players. Now there's a catch. Humans are humans. Yes. We've got venture capital and board of directors and lots of people running these companies. When they start collecting all of that money, how likely are they going to be to actually distribute it all back out? There's going to be a temptation, just like in traditional Web2 games, for them to find ways to hold as much as possible because they want their balance sheets to go up. So it's going to be really interesting. I think ethics are going to play a much bigger role now. Agreed. And morality is going to play a much bigger role now than we've ever seen because we're all going to be watching these game title companies now and go, how corrupt are you? You know, are you actually going to stick and to what you're saying And I think that that's a super healthy thing because I Me think too. When, when you say it out loud, you go, wow, I actually have never held any gaming companies to that standard and instead just paid them money for their product. That's and right. should you do that? No, you should... Like, you know, there's certain things we hold under a very high grade yes. of scrutiny. And, I mean, we spend eighty game, $80 on games brand new already. Like, yes. that deserves some scrutiny. You it know? does. I, I definitely know I bought some games that don't warrant that $80 Same. and didn't give me back my value. And if I had only done a little bit more research, research I would have known that. And they have a two-token system. So there's the Territe and the Asterite. I think they said there was $1 billion, don't quote me. I love $1 this billion system. each. But yeah, there's one that's kind of, it seems like the Territe is going to be inflationary. There's going to be more minted down the road. It's the in-game currency. Everyone can earn it. You earn it right away. There's actually like a little uh, buff thing where you got to play a bit to get your counter up to earn the max Territe. So the way yeah. I understand it is you do your dailies, you do your things, you get that to the highest, and then you go fight and some monsters. And then you go do the real And stuff. you do your yeah. things and you get the highest reward. But then the Asteroid token is reserved for top 10% players. It's only accessible through the 3v3 arena PvP mode and high world raid bosses. And that's supposed to be a deflationary model. And they're talking like about sustainability and all this other interesting stuff. Like the tokenomic aspect, actually, I was quite impressed. You can tell they it sounds like they know what they're doing. And they've got some bold goals with it. It's another thing if we see that they follow through with it. Yeah, I think that like the reason that I like it the most is because rewarding the players that play the most. So mm -hmm. if you, like, I feel like that should by nature balance the worry that a lot that I think a lot of crypto projects have of if we make it like I think the reason a lot of crypto projects go for limited amount of time or battles or whatever or, or even the reason that they're auto battlers mm -hmm. right now is because they're not sure that if they let us play a game that's fun that we have skill impact on that we can binge all day if we're going to earn too much earnings so that's they have point. to limit us they think 
And I think once they find out that, like, you know, what the, I think this is a good testing ground because with most idlers, what happens is at first it's, like, exciting and there's too many things to do. And then you get to that, you know, the real grind part. Yeah. And that's where most people fall off. And this and the way they've designed this terrorite and asteroid system, that point where the weak-handed ones kind of fall away, that's where you start needing, that's where you'll start really earning the earnings. And I think that will kind of, by nature, limit. So I'd like to see some, what I guess I'm saying is that I'd like to see some games that aren't idle, trying like a full, you can play this for 12 straight hours a day actively playing, but because you're only earning at the highest level of the game, that will, by nature, kind of limit them paying out too much and kind of make their... Yeah, you know, you're right. We don't, quite, we don't quite have that yet. No. Right? And there's some titles like Mavia is one that I feel is going to yes. accomplish this, where the more time invested, the more your skill, the more you earn. That's what people are looking for, is that skill variance-based game. But one thing I do want to mention, which is a little controversial, is there's actually some exploiting that was happening in Nino Kuni a couple days ago. Oh, and really? I actually got excited about this, but here's why. People were exploiting the 3v3 dual mode and clipping through the world so they couldn't get killed. So oh. what was happening is they were always winning. Now the asteroid token, you get it through there. So uh-oh, we've got an exploit or a hack that's allowing people to earn the rare token and actually earn more money. Big problem. Yeah, right? especially if it's infallible Holy crap. and you can't be damaged. Now you've too. got real money involved and there's exploiting and hacking. So I, w I went, yes, because now that company has to figure out anti-cheat, anti-exploit yesterday. Because yeah. it's, they can't let this run for weeks. They can't let this run for months like we see in traditional games. I mean, Clash of Clans, there was modding for years. And the company just super seldom never said anything. Like, pretended like it didn't happen. Absolutely. Right? <laughs> Netmarble, within three days, actually just yesterday, released a notice. It's fixed. Sorry, we've got it. We're taking all kinds of extra steps. We understand this was a big issue and a concern for people. Don't worry. We're even going to retroactive do some stuff against those people. And it was like, wow. Now That's we're seeing a company expect. address the concerns of the game, fix something immediately, because exploiting and cheating and hacking, although a lot of people don't want to talk about it, is a big concern for these crypto projects. And that happens in mainstream gaming all the time. The yes. amount of people I've told or I've heard say, I'm sure this guy on Call of Duty Warzone was hacking. I'm sure this guy on Apex was hacking or aimbotting. Like, we should be at a level now in 2022, I feel like... Level with me here, people. I feel like we're at a point where gaming should be advanced enough that we figured out how to make it absolutely no cheating, right? I and I think the, that blockchain yeah. is like when you add money, people losing real money into the aspect, yeah. that's enough of a fire under everybody's ASS to really Get maybe moving. create something that's so infallible that like all of anti-cheat for all of gaming levels yes. up. And that's what I'm hoping for when I hear these kinds of stories. And stars. that's why I got excited. There was some fun in the community about it. But I looked at the flip side. I went, no, this is a great opportunity for them to address something right away and also lead by example in this crypto NFT space to say, hey, yeah, we've got a fun first playable game that has some of the same risks as all the other ones. We're noticing it's getting exploited. We need to address it now not let it run off and not talk to their community, pretend like it's not happening like we've seen. And yeah, they did. They addressed it super quick. A lot of people are really happy about what they did. I, we don't even know the full details of how they maybe punish some of those players. Maybe they're banned. Maybe they, they're, they're just gone. Maybe their their wallets got locked and they're not allowed to cash out. how it matters as much as the fact that they did it at all. Me too. Yeah. Me too. 100%. And so I'm really excited to see where that goes. And one other thing I'll mention before we move on to Grit for the last couple of minutes here is they seem to be very aggressive with pushing the NFT crypto stuff in everybody's face, which mm -hmm. I'm really happy about. Like there's pop-ups in the game. You're seeing the Territe stuff, the Asterite. Like there's quests around it. You can use the Territe to level up your kingdom. So they're not like shoving it off to the side. It's everyone's playing Nino Kuni because it's Nino Kuni. And then there's all this stuff about NFT crypto. Like so it's starting to really kind of let other people who didn't know about that be like, oh, what's this NFT stuff? Oh, what's this? token stuff and i like that they're doing that it has they're to happen an ambassador it has to happen because you know yep. what the first time everybody saw google ads on their or saw ads showing up at all from anywhere <laughs> on their web pages they were like i'm uncomfortable with this yep. but then eventually we all just got desensitized realized that's a way that people raise money and that it sometimes ends up positively affected some of our favorite sites because they can collect ad, ad revenue or portions of it right yes and then we just got like we just blotted it out now we just like when i go down to a website i don't see anything besides the content so I feel like if you just throw it in their face enough, 
people will just go, I don't like that, and remove it, or they'll go, eh, and they'll finally check yeah. it out, and maybe they might end up discovering something Well, here's they the really thing, like. too. You can be a free-to-play player, earn the tarot token. You're going to get to a point where if you get far enough in the game, you're going to be like, I have all this token. What should I do with it? I might as well figure out what it's like to open a wallet and take my money out, because otherwise I've got this thing doing nothing that's actually worth real money. And that's where I like, again, that's where I, that circles back to why I think this, like, Gala Games have, have yes. an ecosystem with multiple studios and games in it idea. Because if you're that player who's on the, like, I've just started Play to Earn and I didn't even know I was playing to Earn till just now. Yeah. And then I find out this Territe token, ter token and Asteroid token are useful in other games. Let's say there's a new IP that comes out that I recognize that's as recognizable as Nino Kuni, and I go all of a sudden, whoa, I want to play that one. And then you see on the banner, hey, it costs this much territe or whatever. Then you go, oh, wait, I have that. I didn't realize that was yeah. for that. I didn't, and then you'll start going down that rabbit hole on your own. And I think that like, that's what I was saying at the start of the episode. I think maybe the best way to get mass adoption to happen is to just make amazing games slide in the fact that there's NFTs and then have people just all of a sudden be adopted because they're already enjoying the game. Yeah, and we can see there's a there's a drive for big companies to do this just for the sake of being on the bleeding edge or innovative. Yep. Because when everyone looks back at tech companies and Google and Amazon and Facebook, they did that 20, 30 years ago. So all these game companies are like, okay, we need to be on top of this. We have the capital to deploy. Let's learn. And I, that's why I have a lot of respect for GoGala Games and what they're doing with Epic because they partnered with Epic, which is huge. Like, uh, yeah, the I'm amount a... of millions of players that are on that platform are insane. Now we've got an NFT game that's literally like you could be completely removed from everything crypto NFT, and you're just playing your Web two games on your Epic and your Steam, and now all of a sudden NFT games are coming in at you. You didn't choose for that exposure, and you can still choose. You can be like, no, I'm not doing it. But now it's going to start that You're going to get those impressions. You're going to get the impressions. We're kind of exposing more people. And and let's uh, maybe we can dive into this in another video down. Like, let's give Gala Games a little while longer, see what comes happens with Grit, take a look at some roadmaps, some more gameplay footage. But mm -hmm. I think what they did was a really great move for the whole crypto play-to-earn system with mass adoption. I think on the other side, too, that it is a good move for Epic Games. I think yes. maybe that's one thing I'll leave off with is that... Yeah. Epic Games, if you look at like Steam and other and other like large software services in Web2 that offer many games, mm -hmm. Epic is kind of the weaker one because it's kind of new and they that's why they Here's offer these free ahead. games. So this is a way for them to offer content that not even Steam is okay with offering and not it even is. PlayStation Network is okay with offering, right? Mm -hmm. So I think even on the Epic Games side, thumbs up. Like I think that that's a smart move and for GoGala Games because they're pioneering Web3 and these guys are accepting it. And using that to maybe get on the level of Steam. Agreed. We could talk about that another time. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us today. As you can tell, there was a lot of great information. We tried to cram into a short amount of time. But we're just super excited with all the mass adoption that's happening right now. I mean, that's kind of the theme of, yes. of today's episode. <laughs> so we look forward to seeing you guys in our next episode. And until next time, cheers.